Good. So hello, everybody. For those of you who are already here, I think so, some more will trickle in. Uh, I think we next time we might open actually the room up five minutes earlier, let everybody come in. Um, so we have a great session today about innovation readiness. And we have special guests that Tendai is going to introduce in a second. And we're going to uh, look at a couple of tools, but not just in theory, um, how they were applied with our special, special guests. So hosts today, um, Tendai, Vicky, who you know, um, and myself, um, we always like to present our two books. Tendai always likes to turn this into a competition, which one is selling better. So we'll, yeah. we'll let the audience <laughs> decide. I always think that you need both anyway, so you don't have to choose. <laughs> you just go to your favorite uh, bookshop online or offline um, and get both of them. Now, Tendai, I'll let you quickly introduce our guests today. Yeah, so thank you everyone for, for joining us and uh, really honored today to have two guests from the Northumbrian Water company uh, from, from the UK. We've been working with them to assess their innovation ecosystem. So on the call with us today is Angela McOscar, who is actually the head of innovation for Northumbria Water. Say hello, Angela. Hey, everybody. Great to be here today. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, Angela's colleague, Nigel Watson, who's the Group Information Service Director at Northumbria Water, who also helps Angela drive the innovation ecosystem there. So hey, Nigel. Hi. Good to see you again, Tendai, and lovely to meet everybody else. Great, great. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to having a conversation with you. Over to you back, Alex. Okay, and uh, I'll already um, answer one of the questions that comes up a lot. You are going to get the recording. We have a lot of people who sign up and then watch the recording later. So these events are always sponsored by some of our products. So here you get a discount promo code on the Testing Business Ideas Virtual Masterclass with uh, David Bland, we'll be leading it and I will be co-hosting with him. So if you're interested, sign up for the Testing Business Ideas. We really go deep, deep into the techniques of how to test and de-risk business ideas. Now, let's get started with the content for today. So the theme is innovation readiness and in particular, the assessment of innovation readiness. But now let's look at a quick kind of statistics number out there. So in a recent Accenture report, um, we'll take this as a proxy, they studied how many companies have extensive innovation governance. And if you look at it, it's actually <laughs> very few, only 12% have innovation governance, 88% don't. Now, a lot of companies, as you can see in the next five years, they plan to invest more in innovation. And one of the things to really make sure is you understand where you have strengths and weaknesses today when you move towards innovation. And that's what innovation readiness is all about. But if we take this as a proxy, do you have strong innovation governance today? We'll actually just throw up a quick poll to see, you know, what's the case in your organizations? Do you have strong innovation governance or not? And if you are a coach or consultant, please pick a company that you uh, work with or for um, as an advisor. So Gab, who is in the background always, thank you Gab already for making this possible, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Maybe you can throw up the poll for us, um, the first one, which is all about strong innovation governance. So do you or your clients have strong innovation governance? Please um, hand in your vote now practicing voting like uh, other countries do that live still always fun to make <laughs> a bad joke <laughs> okay so don't just type into the chat window please share in um so i think everybody can see the voting we'll give it another couple of seconds before we close and Tendai, from your experience, the companies that you've worked with so far, how many have strong innovation governance? Uh, very few. I'm actually surprised that the 80%, the, the, the 20 percent or the 12 percent that they say have, have have strong innovation governance. A large majority of companies don't have strong. Okay, so here we have a group with 64 uh, percent who don't have innovation governments governance. Uh, 21 percent, so actually pretty close to what we've seen and 15% are unsure. 
So very close number. So we can confirm <laughs> what Accenture tells us. And that's a pretty extensive uh, study. So you can Google it. It's a pretty interesting uh, study to look at. And we'll show actually one more thing from that study. So what they also show is that the revenue trajectory of companies that really have or have adopted innovation governance is, um, is, is more positive, right? So it's not just something you do because you, uh, you want to ha have innovation theater there, but it's something that does have an impact. So these are the kind of um, statistics we also use to, to convince our, our clients of working on innovation governance. We call it, you know, before we get to innovation governance, innovation readiness. So what is innovation readiness for us? I'll do a quick intro before I throw it over to Tendai to actually look at the real world case study. We look at three things when we start working with companies to assess the innovation readiness. The first one is, you know, how does the innovation portfolio look today? What types of initiatives exist? Because there is no company probably on the planet that doesn't do any form of innovation. The second thing we look at, and this is probably new to many of the listeners, is, you know, the, an assessment of the innovation programs. So not just the activity, but what is the impact of the programs that exist today in an organization in terms of value creation and in terms of cultural change. So we're going to zoom into that um, in a bit. And then at the end, the last thing we're going to look at is the innovation culture. What kind of structures are in place today in an organization to really kind of let um, um, innovation emerge and thrive um, the different types of enablers and blockers. And I'll do a quick intro later on before we look at our case study. And with that, over to you, Tendai, to uh, discuss with our guests what you have been working on. All right, great. If I can take over the screen, maybe, and then I can uh, run, run the session. Okay, cool. Thank you, Alex. Um, so, hi, Nigel. And I. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure working with you. Now, I'd like you to set a little bit of context for, for the audience, right? A little bit of history. Like, how does a utility company like this end up in private hands? Like, what, what actually happened? Well, I guess that goes back to 1999 when the, the UK government at the time decided that they felt that the water industry and others would be best run in, in private hands. And so we are uh, privately owned, but mm -hmm. heavily regulated monopoly, right? So, and you, you'll see as we go through these slides, evidence of some of that um, regulation, I think. Right. But you, you, but but you, you, you kind of describe yourself as a monopoly because there's no other company that can do what you do within your region. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, we serve all of the customers within our region. So we operate in the northeast of England, and then uh, we we provide water and wastewater services in the northeast, in Essex and Suffolk, which are in the the sort of further south in England, and we provide clean water services. So we've about four and a half million customers, 3,200 employees, and just a little a little less than a billion pounds in revenue. Exactly, and there's something you said to me that was really interesting when we were talking about your context. You said your revenue is guaranteed and capped. That's right, yeah. So it's a weird process if you're from outside the water industry, and I'm only five years in myself, but every five years, we turn in a business plan to our economic regulator who are called Offwap. Uh, and we explain, look, this is, these are the things that we need to do to run our business, to enhance our business. And then there's a process which lasts probably a, a 18 months, nearly two years back and forth. And at the end of that, they basically say, this is how much money you've got to run your business for the next five years. Wow. And it's guaranteed, as you said, and capped. Right. Guaranteed and capped. So then the question becomes a company that's a monopoly with revenue that's guaranteed what is the value of innovation? Like what would cause a company like yours to reach out to a company like ours to do some collaboration, right? Why would you want to work with a strategy? Yeah, so I guess the regulator has tried over a period of time and is getting closer and closer to emulating market forces by using incentives and penalties. So right. if we have, if we achieve over a certain level, we, we get some additional reward. And if we uh, underachieve our targets, then we are penalized. And that provides an incentive to us to innovate. Um, I think as well, there's a lot of forces 
upon us now probably more than ever of change um and you know that is causing us to have to do things differently right and you're obviously working in a sort of highly regulated environment right you're a highly regulated monopoly, which puts a lot of constraints in terms of what you can do. I remember Angela saying, we're not allowed to make a different flavor of water or something like that. We only have to do the real water. For, 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 that, that's for exactly water. right. I mean, people might take some comfort from that indeed, that we can't be playing around with the, the quality of the water or changing that's the right. color of it for that matter. Much as well, Angela exactly. would obviously like to, you can tell from her hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's really that's that 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 that's fantastic. And the truth about this, right, Alex, and and we recognize this every time we're working with large organizations, is that every company is kind of working with some sort of constraint, right? And so, what we'd like from 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 the audience is, um, I think, and Alex is again going to take over the screen here. If you can go on menti.com, and Gab is also putting a link on the on on in, into Zoom chat there, so you can go onto menti.com and then use the code 61905422 and uh, or you can use the QR code that I've just put up here and we just want you to describe in one word the main cons the main con constraint that limits your organization uh, from uh, becoming much more innovative or doing innovation so I'll stop sharing my screen Alex you can show us the word cloud here we go okay Let's see what comes up. The big one Money. already was politics, right? <laughs> politics. Not, not a surprise. Money, yeah. okay, that's that's surprising. Politics makes it back up again. <laughs> like a competition, politics. which word, right? Interesting. Culture. Oh, look at that. That's bubbling yeah. up. Culture, Culture, big one. Budget, is there? Mindset? Yeah, mindset. mindset. Yeah. Management. Okay, so really culture, money, politics. Yeah. It sounds like the title of a magazine, The Culture Money Politics Show. Yeah. <laughs> but those are definitely the big ones, right? And some of the research shows that politics and culture are actually... So what's, what's showing up here is what some of the research of uh, Innovation Leader also shows, is that culture and politics are the two big preventers of innovation. So it seems that <laughs> that is confirmed. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And we can see the world, the, you know, the, 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 sort of, sort of the puzzles are sort of bubbling up there and showing those. So maybe yes. Nigel and Angela, is, is this some, any of that resonate there that you see? I'd, I'd say it, it does resonate. I mean, um, we've been on a journey of being deliberate, of having some machinery and some governance with innovation for the last five years. Um, it reminds me a bit of earlier in my career when I did Six Sigma at GE Capital. And it you know, when, you, when we first did it, we had some, some black belts and they felt a little bit out of an adjunct to the business. And then gradually it became yeah. the way we did everything. And, and I think we're starting to see signs in our business now where innovation is becoming part of BAU, but you know, we've definitely got a bit yeah. further to go. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I would so absolutely I'm gonna, agree with that. I'm and I'm also sharing. resonating with quite a few of the comments in there. Mm. Right. Thank you, Angela. So now let's talk a little bit about like, you know, the constraints, your, your big constraint, which is the, um, the regulations, the, 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 the cause you say that, the, you know, that your regulators trying to create almost like a free market system where you have all these incentives and targets that you have to hit. And people just have no sense of how many of those metrics you actually have. And you sent me this like, this like spreadsheet of all the metrics you have to hit. So I'm just going to show that to people. So they really see like, what kind of like what that looks like, like the number of targets that you 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 kind of have to hit, right? Then just talk talk us a little bit about like what this is about. Yeah, th this is our, our monthly scorecard, um, and obviously it won't take you through every measure because, but you can see readily that there's a lot. And I think my first reaction when I joined the business was, oh, we need to have less measures. But the reality is, every single one of these is a regulatory measure, right? And and, so and starting at the top. There are measures of customer service, and then there are measures of how well we are doing at supplying the clean water service, how well we are doing at supplying wastewater, and then there's some other things like greenhouse gases. You know, so um, water companies use a lot of energy. Exactly. So the interesting thing about your situation is most of the companies that we work with, right, can actually choose what metrics they want to focus on or 
around innovation, but your balanced scorecard is those metrics are regulatory. There's no option. Like if you don't hit these, right, there are financial rewards for the performance, and then you get financial penalties if these targets are not met. That's right. I mean, we have to update. Um, I mean, we look at these things every month, but we report them back to the regulator every year. Um, and there's a whole audit process that goes around to ensure the accuracy of the numbers. So it's not something you can play with. Right, exactly. So, and you'll be sort of, you know, the, so some of the stuff just to sort of, you know, help people understand. So you, you, you have to keep metrics on leakages, on flooding, on sewer blockages, on pollution incidents, and greenhouse gases. And this is just to name a few of the things that you have to track and report back to the regulator. It's pretty, just pretty to name a few, thing. yeah. And I, so, I guess though, and we, we try to look at these things, and I guess it's true of any constraint is if you, can you flip it around? Can you make that into a, a gift? Can you make that into an enabler for innovation, right? And so what has really helped us in our language and our purpose of innovation within the business is to say, we're, we're doing innovation to improve our performance on leakage. We're doing innovation to improve our performance on pollution and sewerage. And everybody recognizes that we're constrained. So if you if you look at the money that the regulator gives us to run our business, um, mm -hmm. we can't hit the targets quite often using the methods that we've used in the past. So that right. that tells you very clearly we have to do some things differently. Hence yeah. innovation. Exactly. And we were having this conversation, right, about like, you know, what is the number one disruptive threat for you for 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 your business or what will be a disruptive threat for you uh, for a utility company and while we have that conversation folks can be typing in zoom chat what they think would be the disruptive threats for a, for a utility company but in our conversation together right we would think you you know you were like you know communicating that you know these are some of your disruptive threats so climate change population growth and you know aging assets can you just say a little bit about that before we move yeah, on yeah so i i guess if you look at you know external forces the regulator as you they're they're changing all the time our employees and our customers expectations are changing i think that's probably common across all industries climate mm -hmm. change is a really big one for us though so we see that in big dramatic ways so um believe it or not in the UK, prolonged dry spells. So where we operate in the south of England, it has a lower rainfall per head than Palestine. That's a pretty mm -hmm. shocking statistic. And, you know, we're, we're a little wasteful of our resources. So that's, that's something that we definitely, you'll see in our scorecard, we have a per capita consumption target, which is to persuade people to use less of our product. Um, mm -hmm. There's not many people have a target like that to chase. And then, um, <laughs> We have, we see after those long dry spells, sudden downpours, and that can lead to flooding. We're one actor in that scene. There are many people involved in flooding and flood mitigation, but we are certainly one of them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, climate change hits us like that in big ways. We're also seeing it in, I guess, some more, more creeping ways like um, algae blooms that only used to happen in July and August and now happen all year long. Um, so, you know, it affects the way we treat the water uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find ourselves in the way that we treat wastewater just because the temperature is, I don't know, one degree more than it was 10 years ago. Uh, the chemical treatment is, is different. Right. And so, like, in, in, in terms of the, you know, your innovation goals, it's really to respond to these challenges. And though that's why, we you know, we, we ended up collaborating together. So, yeah. So thank you so much for, like, having that conversation. What I'd like to do now is to transition to the actual work that we did together and kind of try and bring in, bring Angela into the conversation a, a, a little bit. So okay. one of the first pieces of like assessments that, that, that we did, right, was focusing on your innovation portfolio. And in terms of innovation portfolio, what we really care about when we're working with organizations, you know, such as, such as yours, is what is the balance in, in, in your portfolio? So, you know, how many things do you have that are exploring new opportunities? versus how many things you, you have as an organization or how many innovations you have that are about you know, exploiting your, your, your current success. And across that spectrum of explore and exploit, there's really like three types of innovation that you know, organizations can kind of engage in. So one is efficiency innovation, kind of like what Amazon did with these robots that increased the efficiencies in their, in their warehouses, but didn't really change their business model that much. 
And then, you know, we can have sustaining innovations, which are when an organization can take some of its current capabilities, maybe build a technology around it, and then, and then maybe enter new markets and maybe create new, you know, new business models around that. And then we can have, you know, transformative innovation where a company goes and creates a completely new business model, different from anything that they, they've actually ever, 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 ever worked on, like Amazon did with Amazon Web Services here. And that's a really interesting formula to assess your business. And I remember when I showed you this, Angela, you had significant queries about whether this really applies to you. Can you just explain a little bit about that? Uh oh, I think Angela Kip took over the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Having come from a, a corporate background, I could... <laughs> Having come from a corporate background, I could totally um, relate to the examples that you've got with uh, with Amazon. However, when I applied the lens from our water business, uh, the same just, just didn't translate. What we would consider translate transformative for our business would probably go into uh, you know a much uh, more sustaining or efficiency bucket uh, using your lens. So actually, it was a a really useful tool for us to use just to see um, how it how it would work but also then how we could get it to work for ourselves given that we are a little bit of a different business exactly and in that first meeting i remember that you had used your own lens and sort of distributed the you know your different innovation projects across the board and i remember pushing you back and like making you have to do it this way where you only have like you know seventy percent of your stuff is you know efficiency innovations and thirty three percent is uh, sustaining innovations and like zero under transformative and I remember that like was like no that's that, that's not fair right yeah no absolutely because um because if you were used to applying it uh, perhaps more in a more corporate business where the rules of the game are different whereas when you're mm -hmm. used to uh, to working with um with the monopoly regulated scene that, that we're working in the rules of the game are totally different. So you need to apply a different lens in order to make sense of this tool. Right, oh yeah, I got my math wrong. It's 110%, I went 77 and 23, yeah, that's a typo. Thank you for noticing that, Ralph. Well, you know, uh, yeah, you guys are a super company. Uh, so we have a poll question for, 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 for the audience, right? Before we show you how we then did the reclassification work. So Gabby, if you could launch that for us, right? So what percentage, within your company, would you consider transformative innovation, right? You know, so we just want to see what, what, what folks think is happening in their world. And just to bring in, you know, Alex, like in your experience, like what are you seeing out there in terms of the percentages of transformative innovation? I would say transformative is usually at zero, but only yeah. after I ask a couple of questions. So people would always put things there and then I ask, well, okay, so you built something like Amazon Web Services and then they say, oh, it's just an idea. <laughs> well, then, then it shouldn't be there yet. <laughs> like, that's great that you have the aspiration, but those are results, right? So usually very weak on the left-hand side. And to a certain extent, if you do that deliberately, it's okay. Like if you are at the top of your game and you, you just have to, you know, scale, that's okay. But in general, it's not deliberate. It's not a deliberate choice. And that's where it gets problematic. Right. Thank you, Gap. So if we can see the results. And again, Alex, you're right, right? So 0 to 10% is like the, you know, you know, the, the, the higher size of, 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 sort of you know, the number of responders that are saying they do transformative innovation. And I wonder how many of those 0 to 10% are really like 0, right? <laughs> or is it you know, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the 10%? So yeah, so let's keep on moving with this so that we can keep the conversation going. So, what we decided to do then was to have a conversation about how we can maybe actually categorize your innovation projects in a way that's much more meaningful for your, for, for, for your business. So rather than explore and exploit, we thought about maybe doing it and calling it pioneering versus maintaining your current infrastructure, right? And so, and here we focused on more like a change perspective, right? You know, stuff that's more focused on societal and environmental impacts. So, you know, and the more you go towards societal and environmental impacts, the more we call those kinds of innovations, transformative innovations versus innovations that are just focused on maintaining your current infrastructure or just hitting those targets that, 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 that you currently have. So th this seemed to make more sense. And when we did that, then the data started changing, right? So we had 28% in efficiency, 48% in, in sustaining, and 24% in transformative. I hope this adds up to 100, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about that. <laughs> so, so, so I just want people to understand, Angela, like, um, 
those projects there that are in transformative, like what makes them transformative? Okay, so I think that um, one of the uh, good examples that we've got here is uh, it's on there as NUR, which is the National Underground Asset Register. And this has been really transformational, just not only for ourselves, but also for other utilities and for the, for the, for the country uh, at large. In that, um, usually uh, under the ground, there is a whole host of uh, pipes and cables that are not just ours. And unfortunately, when you go and do any uh, amount of street works, you will unfortunately come across a, a utility strike. So you will either strike somebody else's cable or somebody will strike your pipes. And this cause is just a terrible mess and disruption for the businesses involved, can also be incredibly, um, have a huge health and safety impact to the individual, but also to our customers, you know, roads and, uh, and disruption is, uh, is, is left amok. And there's a total value of this on the UK as a whole about um, 1.6 billion uh, pounds worth of disruption and meth. So therefore, you can see that by coming up with a solution for that, uh, you can significantly reduce that, that figure and also reduce disruption to our customers. So what we did from our innovation festival, um, this idea was, was mooted as a, as a great idea, but just felt a little bit out of reach because it was spread across a number of different stakeholders. And as we all know, pulling people together and, and, and you know, pulling in the same direction can often be quite difficult. So what we did is we've got, is, as we've coined now, is something called a year's worth of work in a week where we put together the right people for one week in a tent in Newcastle with the explicit goal of being able to create what would this look like? And one of the key blockers was actually a data sharing agreement. So we actually put the lawyers uh, at, one, at one end of the tent with a piece of paper and a pen and said, right, you're not leaving here until we have that. And you know what? Miraculously, that actually happened in a week, um, yeah. which you can imagine how many emails and meetings and time that that would cost doing it in, in other methods. In addition, mm -hmm. they actually mapped as a demonstrator Sunderland during that week. Uh, and this then whet the appetite of, of the UK government, who then have sponsored this project to the tune of about four million with the idea that this will be rolled out across the country. So that for me, that is transformative. I know using your uh, initial lens, you wanted to put us into the efficiency bucket, but I have to say, I had to put my foot down there. Exactly. And you can imagine that conversation, right? Because I'm like, okay, so you're still in the water business even after you do this. So this goes over here. You're like, no, it's, it's transformative because it's got this other massive impact, right? In terms of what's happening in the industry and what's happening across, the, you know, like all the environmental and, 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 and societal impacts around that. So uh, I'll give you a chance to explain one more of these before we have to move on because of time. Could you talk, you know, you, you can choose digital twin or downpipe. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take downpipe if you like, because it, it's probably the easiest one to, for, for people to relate to. So imagine you've got um, an IoT connected radiator on the outside of your house, effectively something that looks like a radiator. So the idea of this is we could increase the storage of water uh, and attenuate flooding, right? So when there's a big storm coming in, we can connect to the people who have these smart downpipes and we can release capacity. Um, so that will clean, that will have the effect of cleaning the sewers and making sure that if there are any fatbergs or anything like that in there, um, <clears throat> they can also use that water in there to water their gardens and wash their cars and things like that. But the big benefit is when that storm comes in and those downpipes are empty, we can hold that water back. And that mm -hmm. will, we believe, make a significant impact to flooding um, in those, in the areas that are prone to flooding. I guess, and that's really the key to this is, not just the device, but the analytics that goes around determining where to place those in, in um, you know, in in the um, people's houses, which houses. Right. No, that's fantastic. And 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 what's interesting about this, right, is that like the innovations that you're working on, they're not just about improving your business. I mean, in one sense, they do that, but they go beyond improving your business and even go beyond those, you know, those targets that you've been set. And to really think about, like you know, the, your overall place in the in the in the in, in the environmental e ecosystem in the UK. That that's our gift, I think, and that's what makes water an attractive platform. And you'll come on and talk about our festival in a bit. I mean, we've had nine hundred other organisations join us to create new ideas and to innovate. 
And I think what attracts them is a, is a few things. Um, one of them is we can't do anything with the IP, right? So um, people can come with us and develop ideas and then go away and commercialize them. Uh, but the, the, the main thing I think is really our purpose and that sort of societal and environmental impact. And water is so important in all of our lives that I think securing a resilient supply, making sure that you know flooding is flood risk is mitigated when we've got this massive challenge of the climate emergency. People are really interested in fixing those ideas with us. Yeah, fantastic. And so the reason we do this, by the way, before I move on, is that we believe that every organization should have a balanced portfolio, right? You should have you know, innovations that cover the spectrum from efficiency, sustaining, and transformative, right? So when we do this assessment with companies, when we reveal to them the balance in their portfolio, sometimes some leaders, it's the first time they're actually seeing it make this visual, and that allows them to make better and more informed decisions, right? Alex? Yeah, one thing I just add is that it needs to be a deliberate choice. And in many cases, it just happens. And then, and then companies don't realize, oh, there's so much going on in efficiency. And because they're using crazy new technologies, they think they're reinventing the world. But while their business model is dying, you know, they haven't invented anything new. So basically, it's, you know, almost, uh, uh, you know, dying more efficiently with a dying business model. So that is not always a deliberate choice because nobody really looks at the entire portfolio very systematically. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's part of becoming innovation ready is, is making sure you have, a, you, you have a balanced portfolio. And then the next conversation we had was, so all those innovation projects that you're, you're working on within, within North Umbrian, right? They're driven by the program. They, they emerge, you just described the innovation festival just now. They emerge from the programs that you're kind of running, running within your company. And again, a strategy that we believe that when you're running those innovation programs, you, you don't just pick any random innovation program. Let's do a hackathon, right? You don't just pick any little random innovation program and, and, and just do it. You have to be deliberate about the choices that you're making, right? Are you creating value in terms of either increasing revenue or hitting some really significant metrics that your organization has, has actually set? Or are you like really focused on changing the culture to make innovation a much more repeatable process within within your within your your business? So these are the two dimensions that we use to classify some of your innovation programs. So I want to run a quiz, right? So Nigel, you got to help me with this and, and, and you too, Angela, right? So we're going to show these three innovation programs that, that you run. And then the goal of the audience is to type in Zoom chat the correct classification, A, B, C, O, D, of where those three programs sit. But they can only do that if you tell them what they are. So just give a brief description of what each one of those is. And then people can start to type in Zoom chat where they would put that, right? The, the number, the letter number sequence there. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the Innovation Festival, which I just touched on, um, which is an annual event for us. Um, it's normally, we did it virtually this year for reasons which are fairly obvious, I guess. We normally run this as literally as a festival. So it's, a, I, I describe this to my boss as Glastonbury, but without the sex and the mud, right? So it's it's got the feel of a British summer festival, which is very intentional because it attracts people we want to have fun um, we want to have a creative and inspiring environment but in the middle of that we'll run um, hacks sprints and the thing that Angela described as a year's worth of work in a week and in the the one that we did this year albeit virtually we ran 40 of those um, 40 sprints hacks years worth of works in a week so it's mainly our idea generation engine cool all right and then invest quest what is that Angela so InvestQuest is a program open to our employees where they can suggest meaningful improvements to the business that will give a, will give a good rate of return over a three-year period. So it's right. much more focused on um, incremental improvements. Transformative we'd mm -hmm. love, but uh, we've been running this for a few years now, so the basket of those is uh, diminishing somewhat. Right. Okay, it's, it's a way of then, employees having an idea that, and jumping the queue, really. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And then finally, innovation ambassadors, right? Well, what are those? Yeah. The innovation ambassadors 
our employees across all different functions and across all different levels in the business. And they are really the engine room of how we're doing innovation within Northumbrian Water in that we have a hub and spoke mechanism. So they are in with myself and Nigel in, in the hub where we have um, an opportunity to share uh, innovative practices and what's going on around the business. And then they take that out to their function and then they bring their challenges back into the hub for solution. Right, right. Okay, fantastic. So I can see people already typing in 3D, 3D, I can see a lot of, of scores coming in there, 1D, 2C. So let's see where Nigel and Angela actually placed these when we were doing the analysis together. I think the Innovation Ambassador one will be kind of disappointing. It's, it's probably more this way, right? Than, 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 so that was a chick question. It, was, it wasn't like a proper solution. Even Alex with his mouth open, like, what? Why would you ask such a question? So, but yeah, so this is how they were kind of laid out um, in, 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 on, on the map. And in addition to that, we also mapped out the rest of the other programs that were being run within the business with the sense that we wanted to sort of see where all of these programs sat. So now I have two questions for you. The first one is, could you just talk me through how, how these things interconnect? So is there like a relationship between any of these or are they independent? So let's start with say, somebody pops an idea in InvestQuest, like how does that connect to the rest of the ecosystem here? And so I guess, um... Principally, right, two, two main engines, that's our machinery. So creation of ideas and then getting from idea to value. So right. they're, they're, these things are linked, right? So if you were to take InvestQuest, for example, somebody comes in with an idea, they can get up to £250,000 worth of investment um, right. first off um, to, to, to fund that idea. That, I, that InvestQuest thing happens within the Innovation Festival for a start. Um, mm -hmm. They will typically be supported by the innovation ambassadors. So the people mm -hmm. who are coming forward with these ideas are quite often not used to preparing a business case. Right. So they will be supported in that process. Um, we use Amplify to get the ideas in. Right. And um, Drop Zones is basically an idea of testing. It's very hard to test in live environments. So we need particular places where we can go and test out That's ideas right. and so it's entirely possible but not always the case that the idea that comes out of InvestQuest um, needs to be an experiment and will need some kind of uh, testing facility to make it prove that it, okay. it, it's technical or environment um, economic feasibility exactly and so the reason why we ask this question by the way so that the audience can really understand is people are always asking me and Alex is a hackathon innovation theater and what they're expecting us to do is to take that extreme position that goes, yeah, never do a hackathon. A hackathon is always innovation theater. And the answer to that question is actually no. A hackathon is not innovation theater. A festival is not innovation theater. It only becomes innovation theater to the extent that it's disconnected from everything else. So if it's just a standalone thing, it happens and then nothing happens after that, then it becomes it, it becomes a form of, of innovation theater. And so drawing and if I may just come in on that point, Tendai, because I completely agree, but we, we've had a few goes at this now because we've run our innovation festival for four years. And mm. it's like, how do you create that handoff of the ideas out of the festival, which will generate our first year, I think it was 34 ideas, second year, 56. How many in this year was it, Angela? 100. It was about 100, yeah, 100 ideas. So as you say, they're no use to us if, unless they get picked up and progressed. So- right. We took our festival, which is normally a five-day event, this year and made it four days. And on the fifth day, we brought in our senior leadership group. And we said, right, your job here is to go around, find an idea that you want to sponsor. So we're, I guess, constantly working on making that handoff better. Right. Yeah, fantastic. Right, cool. So Angela, I just want to ask you just another question, which is one of the questions that we always put you know, companies under pressure, which is, how, how do you end up with a program that's like low on value and low on culture change? Well, Amplify is an idea management platform. And, uh, and I guess it's whenever there is something new, it takes time for the organization to want to embrace what you're doing. It also right. needs an awful amount of noise to get the external supply chain to engage with a new tool. So mm -hmm. I think that there are a number of things at play that perhaps we could do better to elevate mm -hmm. and move the impact of, of Amplify. So I wouldn't just blame Amplify. 
right? <laughs> and so there's point. one, sorry, go ahead. Just a good point by Angela, because, you know, wherever programs are, it might also be a result of the organizational kind of setup and what you have done or what you haven't done, right? So the same type of program, a hackathon could very well be down there on the left or could be on top on the right depending how you embedded it, right? So the effort of actually, you know, changing that, or if you can't, sometimes you can't get things off ground. It's like a startup, right? You can't make it work, you gotta kill it, right? So sometimes we experiment with these programs and if we can't move them either up or to the right, then they have yeah. to go, right? So I think this, it, it's the evolution of this kind of thing that we, we have to visualize it so we can even understand. Exactly, and, and the visualization then form the basis of generating those ideas about how we can either add other programs to this mix to make the ecosystem stronger, or we can, you know, find come up with tactics. And that's the other conversation we had when we, when we were doing this assessment. And these were some of the ideas that you came up with, like setting up an innovation board, right, to make investment decisions, creating a system for portfolio management, something that you're working on that's directly related to Amplify, right, the center of excellence, and also, skill, you know, building the skills building and innovation coaches piece, which wasn't really part of the ecosystem at, at the moment. So if you could just explain at least the center of excellence and how that becomes like a net improvement on, 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 on Amplify. So, yeah, so the center of excellence is an industry wide thing. So it's the whole of the UK water industry coming together. So we feel that that will be stronger than us just going out as a company on our own and seeking right. new inputs. Right. And, and, and that can make things a, a little better in terms of making sure those ideas are traction. And, and, Bigger and, ecosystem, right? And, and so it should, it should generate a lot more feedback. Cool. Anything else to add Angela, about, uh, about any of these improvements before we move on to the, to, the, to the last piece of this? I think skills building is a key one because uh, we need to strengthen the, um, the innovation skills that certainly the ambassadors have because then they're the, the role models going out into the business and really demonstrating and flexing those skills. Um, I also think that because we have a hub and spoke mechanism within Northumbrian Water, we genuinely want everybody in the organization being part of innovation in some shape or form. And that doesn't happen overnight. So we definitely need to make sure that we, uh, that we skill build in the right way and enable people and, and make people want to come and, and, and be uh, part of the uh, innovation work that we're doing. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let's move on quickly to another poll question. And now this poll question is, about innovation theater at your company. So at your organization, how much innovation theater are you seeing or how much innovation theater do you have? And the, the scoring is here is like, none of our innovation programs are aligned or integrated. Some of our innovation programs are aligned and integrated or all of our programs are aligned and integrated and we don't have any innovation theater at all. So it'd be interesting to see. And one of the things I'll add to this is, so sometimes we think when we've got beyond innovation theater, that the innovation engine is established in a company. We've actually unfortunately seen companies doing innovation pretty well, or at least parts mm -hmm. of the company. And then the things like the, the success was dismantled for reorg reasons or because innovation didn't have you know, enough power, it wasn't institutionalized. So unfortunately, even when you get beyond innovation theater and sometimes in organizations, it, it doesn't mean, you know, you have long time, long term survival. So very surprising, right? So you have innovation theater, you have success, but then I would put the top level institutionalization where just right. like R&D, you know, R&D doesn't just get dismantled overnight. Unfortunately, even successful programs get killed. Yeah, absolutely. And people are just asking what is innovation theater? It's basically Lots of innovation programs and projects that look like innovation, but are ultimately creating no value, right, in terms of value creation or transformation. So what are the results there? I can't see the poll. Gap, can you show the results? Can you show the results? There, oh, there we go. So some. Okay, great. And you can see like only 6% Alex are saying all of the innovation programs are aligned and integrated, right? The vast majority, like some are integrated and then some are saying none. So it's really interesting because that's the challenge, right? It's a problem that I call little fires everywhere. Someone starts a digital hub here. Somebody starts a hackathon thing here. Somebody starts a design sprint thing there. And before you know it, you've got all of these things all sometimes claiming to do the same thing, overlapping with each other, and nothing is really you know, coordinated. And then a company doesn't get real value from the, from, from the investments that they're making. And, 
the intentions are never bad, right? The intentions are always good and the people are usually pretty smart, but when it's not integrated, even the smartest people, you know, won't, won't be able to have an impact. And that's a pity because that's wasted energy. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. So Alex, we're gonna move over to you to introduce to us the concept of innovation culture. On to our last 15, quick sprint. <laughs> So very briefly, um, you know, many of you have heard me talk about innovation culture, but we started working on innovation culture when we really saw that that, you know, with all the tools, with all the processes, all the smart people, we're still not getting the results. So we um, really try to understand how can we get companies to move and innovation culture, you know, is something that leaders can influence heavily. And that means, you know, not picking the ideas or, you know, creating the growth themselves, but it's creating the conditions for growth, right? Um, giving innovation power, um, putting in place the right metrics, et cetera, et cetera. And number one, maybe just, you know, killing the things that are in the way of innovation. So what we um, used in our last book, The Invincible Company, was the culture map by Dave Gray. So we co-developed this tool together with Dave Gray, where you have three things to look at when you look at an innovation culture. First, the visible part of culture, how do people behave? You know, how do people behave? What are those um, you know, patterns of behavior that you see in teams or in the entire organization? And those behaviors will lead to positive or negative outcomes. And at the end of the day, you can't directly change outcomes or behaviors, but what you can change, and this is the space where leaders really need to focus on is you can work on the enablers and blockers. And in one of the you know, conversations with our colleague from Innocite, uh, 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 Scott Anthony, he said, look, Alex, if you take away the blockers, you've already gone pretty far. So the number one thing to do is just to take away those biggest blockers that exist in most organizations for innovation to emerge. So we look at three things when we talk about innovation culture. The first one, is the leadership support. Now that might sound trivial, but it goes all the way from giving innovation guidance, managing portfolio, resources, etc. Then second one, I think this is the most difficult one. Most organizations we see, they really fail on this one. Organizational design. How did you change your organization to really embrace innovation? Some leaders will say, oh, everybody needs to be an innovator. Well, if you say that, probably you're not gonna have innovation anywhere because then you didn't give innovation real weight. Nobody says everybody now needs to be an accountant, right? Like that doesn't make sense. And then the last one, um, innovation practice, that's down to the tools and practices and processes. And to assess an organization, and I'll hand it back over to Tendai because he'll show how, how you did the assessment altogether. We look at just scoring an organization, neutrally asking, well, how do we score from, uh, from one to five on these different dimensions. So Tendai, what, what happened when you started scoring? Yeah, so if you, I'll, let me share my screen there and then I can, I, and then I can show you. So we, uh, working together with, with Angela and Nigel, we, we set up a survey with, with the Innovation Readiness Assessment in it, and we sent it to 47 people you know, across the organization in various mm -hmm. divisions. I'm just going to put this up here just to show you like the, the makeup. So different departments, right, from all the way from asset management to, you know, you know regulatory assurance, human resources, finance, et, et, et cetera. Also different in terms of like years at, 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 at Novambria. Although you do have a lot of like high, high, high retention, the vast majority of your people have been working there for, for over 10 years. So I have to say that's, you know, must be a good place to work. That, that, that's why we have to go out and innovate though. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, different reporting levels all the way from director, which is a very senior role, and then, you know, to all the way down to people who report to directors. So what did we find? So let's talk about leadership support first. So you can see that as people were scoring, the thing that we noticed was that some people were scoring it high and some people were scoring it low. So when you averaged it, you would get to the sort of middle sort of range, which shows that some innovation work has started happening around leadership support, but there's also a, a lot of work that needs to happen there. And when people were identifying blockers, they were saying a whole bunch of things around like, you know, lack of resources and, and getting buy-in from directors. And then when they were talking about enablers, they were talking about, you know, there's a lot of support and a lot of investment and there's a flat structure. And also management that sort of set up innovation as a, you know, the desire to innovate as a big store. The thing that really stood out to me was 
you know, this finding time in a sort of busy day job, right? This is something that's really, really hard to do within, within established organizations. And we see this over and, and over again. And that's why you need to build like almost like a, a support mechanism for this. Any, 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 any observation on this, Nigel? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one is really genuine, right? I mean, I've worked in businesses that are, let's say, 50% set up to deliver change and 50% set up to keep the lights on. Our business right. by regulation and how it's financed is more like, 90% set up to keep the lights on 10% is for change. And, you know, when you've got uh, to keep the water supply going and someone says, can you fit this new sensor? Um, it's going to be down, you know, somewhere in the network, it's going to be down on the list of things that you do. So I think it's, it's, it's genuine. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the message we keep on repeating and the kind of the cultural bit of this is just go, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting, the results that we, we you know and and so how do you how do you change it unless you can find the time and i think the great thing about innovation ambassadors and the festival is it does draw a lot of discretionary effort and mm. it leverages that what is available in terms of capacity in the ecosystem around us all right fantastic so let's just move on quickly again to sort of org design here and again, this is about legitimacy, power, and, 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 and building a bridge to the core. And again, the scoring, again, was sort of, you know, somewhere around the middle. Again, you know, you can see the sort of balance of, like, work that, 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 that's already happening there, right? So, again, you can see there the scoring was also going so, 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 so straight down the middle. And in terms of blockers, right, people are talking about bureaucracy and, you know, lack of recognition. And then in terms of enablers, the innovation ambassadors were mentioned so often and celebrated so much as like the one of the one of the one of the bigger e e e enablers. And an interesting comment for us, just from a strategizer perspective, was this one around you know innovation agents being too detached or living in their own bubble. Because what we often encourage is that organizations build this bridge between the main business and then and the core business. So it's just an interesting observation that people were making there. And then finally, in terms of innovation practice, right, you'll see again that your scoring was really straight down. It was really interesting because you, you would see this tension with people that are really exposed to innovation and those that are not. And then you see like, you know, that, that, that kind of balance coming out there. And some of the comments that people were making there were, you know, you know, stuff like we need new skills development. We need to focus on, somebody said we need to focus on innovation theater rather than impact. And then the innovation festival was really pointed out, right? That's another thing that came out over and over again, your innovation festival in terms of innovation practice, partner days, hack days, and just having, a, you know, great people with really great ideas. And Angela, you already mentioned this, you know, this, this notion of like skills development is something important, right? As you were mentioning the program that you, you wanted to, to develop, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is a, a key thing in order to, for people to get payback for giving their time and energy to innovation, then we need to build their skills and, and build their capability for themselves, but also to take back to the organization. And I think we're starting to reap some of the benefits of the work we're putting in, but it is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. So, uh, so we are working on this journey and also working with the individuals to understand what they would like to develop because there are a lot of tools and a lot of um, capabilities out there. And we need to make sure that we're bringing in the ones that are um, gonna make the biggest impact in our organization. All right, great, fantastic. So. This is the overall scoring that you, can, you, you kind of got going, right? And so then the question becomes, and that's why we do the assessment, is how then might you improve the innovation culture within the organization? And so the last poll question we're gonna put out to the world today is, if you were Nigel and Angela, which one of these four things would you focus on? Get more leadership support, train more innovation teams, work to align with legal and compliance, or host more innovation events. Let's see what people recommend for you in terms of yeah. the work that you should do. But pointing out that one of the things we've seen in, in past webinars and in our work is that legal and compliance are big blockers, not because they're mean people, right? <laughs> because they're doing their job. So they, they actually are trying to do their job well, right? So that is a, is a big one. And I love that story you told Angela about putting the legal person in the tent, right? And they sit right there, come up with a process of how we're going to do this. And yeah, that's going to be a fantastic story. All right, cool. Gab, if you can show the results so we can kind of bring this show to a close. Get more leadership support and train more innovation teams are the two recommended, which is really interesting because 
those are actually the choices you made. So Gabby, if you can close the, the, the sharing, when we were in, 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 in conversation together, right? You chose getting more leadership support in terms of making sure that we have clear strategic guidance from leadership as one of your areas of focus. And then you also chose, you know, a bridge to the core, like building a bridge between the innovation teams and the, and, and the, and the core business. And then you chose building innovation skills. So, you know, the audience is recommending one and three, and that's exactly kind of the, the, the choices you make. So I just want to talk through like a couple of your ideas around this, right? Just so in the, in the interest of time, but just a couple of your ideas. So in terms of like leadership support, you were talking about like a leading innovation toolbox, you know, innovation mentor and coach for leaders and embedding uh, in, in, in sort of embedding how we measure performance, embedding innovation in how we measure leadership performance. So I'd like you to speak about this one, right? This, this embedding you know, in, in innovation measure. I think having the um, having the leadership fully engaged and on board with innovation is the only way that innovation is going to succeed because they're role modeling for the rest of the organization. So if they're walking the talk, then you have a chance of succeeding because innovation is hard enough as it is without, you know, feeling like you're pushing it and doing it to the organization rather than having the pull for it. So I think that having that uh, measurement uh, by which we have a, a, a specific metric so we can see how well the leaders are performing in this space will encourage them to up their game, which I think would be really, really beneficial. Fantastic. And then in terms of organizational design, right, you were talking about getting IAG members upskilled, um, getting an IAG lead for the South and get them more engaged and then publish a clear process and give visibility and access to all. I don't know which one of these, Nigel, you want to speak to, but if you could just maybe briefly describe just one of these and then we can move on. Yeah, so uh, the Innovation Ambassadors group is what's, what's meant there. And like I said, these are the, mm -hmm. the 40 people who are virtually, so Angela heads a team, which is pretty small. We have uh, five, five, six people. Um, just replying to a question I saw earlier on, but the Innovation Ambassadors group is how we spread innovation across the business. And I think giving them a kind of the confidence, the, the confidence to lead on innovation, the resilience as well for when they fail, because we only expect three or four ideas out of 10 to succeed. Um, so giving them the, you know, the, those kind of tools and techniques, I think is really key. All right, fantastic. And then finally, of course, you're gonna really focus on building innovation skills by introducing uh, training and working with HR and just, and just creating more experience to get that best practice. So we're kind of slowly running out of time here. So I just want to thank you, right, for joining us and having this conversation with us and really showing us the work that you did in terms of like, you know, building this sort of, you know, building this assessment and also sharing with us your journey and all the plans that you're making to improve your, 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 your innovation e ecosystem. Uh, I just want to also say that um, Alex and I and the team of strategizers are actually writing a white paper about how companies can, can sort of you know, improve their innovation readiness and that's coming soon. So you can sign up for that by just signing up to our newsletter and we'll tell you when that's coming out. And we're gonna be sharing tools and, and, and best practices and, and stories from the various companies that we work with within that white paper. So you can also learn how to, how to do that yourself. I don't know, Alex, if you wanna add anything to that. I just want to say thank you to Nigel and Angela for sharing because the best way to learn is uh, seeing how our, others have done it and also you know, sharing some of those uh, challenges because it, it's not success from the beginning, right? We have to learn ourselves into the right way of working. So thank you uh, from, my, from my side as well. Yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us. And then finally, yeah, don't forget to sign up for Testing Business Ideas with Dave Bland and Alex Osvaldo. That's gonna be a lot of fun. And of course, I'm still going to have to win this yeah, competition. Buy the books. So. That's the top thing. <laughs> buy the books. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. And thank you to the audience for the great conversation that was happening on chat as well. Loads of comments there. So thank you so much. And see you soon again as we carry on doing this work with you. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Okay.